They sent me in all sorts of different directions from telling me I needed to see a heart specialist to telling me I had rheumatoid arthritis. She said, you don't need a doctor, you need to get your head checked. Yeah, well, she said, you don't have Lyme disease. So I now have a pacemaker. I had thought I had pulled a muscle in my leg. There was a bit of swelling one day when I woke up. I mean, at that time we were doing tick checks and we never even saw that tick. Well, that overnight was the worst night I can ever remember because I couldn't lie down and I couldn't sleep. It hurt on, on the bottom of my knees. The black-legged tick, the size of a poppy seed. A tiny creature, but one that is causing a huge impact on the lives of Nova Scotians who've been victims of its bite. Many Nova Scotians have a tick story and a disease journey. Through symptom recognition, struggles to gain accurate diagnosis, and lengthy battles to regain personal wellness. Little by little, patterns begin to emerge. The current wave of victims has some things in common, perhaps difficult to identify, but present nonetheless. The experts search for logical explanations based primarily on established procedures. I had the first uh, symptoms in the fall winter of 2015 and then was diagnosed finally um, in the winter of 2016. I had the flu symptoms uh, which had included a lot of stiffness um, which was a little different than regular flu and then um, yeah the, the stiffness really set into my hips first and made it difficult to walk and bend and get out of bed and that just kept getting worse and worse and then it spread a little bit into my knees and to my neck and shoulders and eventually elbows and wrists also. My partner had to help me out of bed. I couldn't tie my own shoes. I couldn't properly shower. By my, I couldn't put my own seat belt on because of the way that you needed to twist. That was really scary, yeah. I went to Emerge. Uh, in Lunenburg when I first had the tick bite and the flu symptoms and um, the doctor that I saw there didn't consider Lyme disease and it was actually my partner who was with me who had to sort of suggest this might be what's going on and could we please test for it um, and then because I didn't have a family doctor I saw about three or four different doctors over the next few months um, in walk-in clinics while we're waiting for tests to come back um, and they sent me in all sorts of different directions from telling me I needed to see a heart specialist to telling me I had rheumatoid arthritis to telling me there's something wrong with my bones. It was a secretary at a family focus clinic in Halifax who sort of saw me coming in again and again and was like why why is this getting worse for you and not better and um, she was the one who asked me, you know, when did you get a Lyme disease test? Do you have the results back? Blah, blah, blah. And when, when she found out that I, I had never received the result of the uh, Western blot test, she started making phone calls to the labs and stuff and trying to find out where it was. And um, that took a couple of weeks of back and forth before we finally found out that it was, well, I was told it was lost. And then when I finally did get a family doctor. Even she said, I don't think it's Lyme, let's hold out, let's uh, check on a bunch of other things. And then, you know, finally when I was basically crippled, um, she said, you know what, let's just try the antibiotic. I think I was wrong and let's just try it. And uh, the symptoms were gone in like three days. Early in the DocFest workshops, these neophyte videographers went to test their interview skills at the Lunenburg Farmer's Market. They were shocked at the number of Lyme stories they found in just over one hour. <laughs> Everybody knows somebody with Lyme disease. Yeah. Um, my very first encounter was about six years ago, I think, or seven years ago. Is that we have uh, pastured chickens, so we move them around, which really helps control the population on the land. I felt like I'd been hit with a sledgehammer. I just, I basically collapsed. Well, I know two 
people who have been affected by Lyme. I have a friend who discovered that she had Lyme disease years later, and it's really had a devastating impact on her health. Lyme has affected me, I guess, by making me a lot more hesitant to uh, tromp through the bush the way I love to do, following my dog hither and yon. Um, and it's uh, frustrating. He's got better tick meds than I ever seem to be able to get. Well, I, I got Lyme about, uh, it'd be about two and a half years ago. When he was about eight, I believe, he got Lyme's disease and it was it was very difficult to convince doctors that that's what it was. Yeah, I would say the fear, uh, the fear and the practical um, realities are, are both a factor for, for me. We have never had it, but we have been uh, bitten many times and we've had to go on antibiotics several times. I, uh, apparently I don't have Lyme yet either, but I live in an area where it's uh, tenfold and uh, ticks are everywhere. I don't know if you can ever be 100% safe, but we have some precautions. A lot of people in my area have, have, and they've gotten Lyme disease, some people multiple times. The pain moves around your body a little bit. And I have had ticks on me this spring. Yeah. Oh yes, I've had a lot of friends who have developed Lyme disease. My husband has been treated proactively for Lyme disease. I have had Lyme disease several times. There is no one-size-fits-all, neither in diagnosis nor in treatment. Our Lyme victim stories are filled with frustration, ambivalence, and controversy. My first diagnosed experience with Lyme disease, I had a small chop in Lunenburg, and I'd had it for about a year, and it was summertime. And one morning in there, I looked down and I had a scoop neck t-shirt and I have thrash here. And I went to the washroom and I checked it. I had this rash here and it was a bullseye and went to emerge. And they did do the blood tests, but they didn't give me any antibiotics or anything like that until the test came back. They managed to lose the blood test. A few days later, I went to my own doctor because by then I was actually feeling miserable. And she's in Halifax. And she started me on antibiotics based on the fact that I still had the remains of the rash. An avid gardener, Sue uses painted daisies to deter ticks. I have a basket of the petals in the house. And if I'm going to be working in an area in the garden where I think that there might be ticks, uh, I'll put some around several hours before I go out. It does, in fact, give me some protection for probably about five feet around here. I don't get ticks. The pyrethrum in the flowers is one of the natural strategies people are turning to. It's actually in the petals, yeah, when they're dried. It's like any other herb. It gets more concentrated as it gets dried. And so, personally, I think it'd be nice if all the towns were planting it. It's a really early blooming flower. This talented artist, John Bird, or Birdie, didn't have a bullseye rash. Uh, I thought I had the flu. I was experiencing some extreme bouts of pain, which I thought were not very fluish kind of a burning sensation. But anyway, uh, we went to the hospital and then they debated it, what it could be. One person said it was, or one doctor said, might be shingles. They hadn't said Lyme disease at that, this point. But my symptoms seemed to be getting worse. And after an eight and a half hour wait, just to get that opinion, they sent me home and just see what happens overnight. Well, that overnight was the worst night I can ever remember because I couldn't lie down and I couldn't sleep. And the pain was just really debilitating. So back we went to the hospital. One thing I had was a, a bout of double vision. And that kept me from driving for about almost a month, which in my business is difficult. Anyway, it's hard on the wife. And at that point, I think by consensus, they seemed to determine that I had Lyme disease. 
This is what I see when I look out my window. And it's the kind of terrain that I have second thoughts about venturing into. Bertie received treatment, but some symptoms persist. I mean, Why? Every day I wake up with a little residual pain on my side back here, um, a burning sensation. I call it a nerve pain. Um, it can be dealt with and I can uh, usually kill it with uh, naproxen or um, ibuprofen. Cooper did. When my son was eight, he Cooper. developed a little rash on his shoulder and the rash grew and it over a week or so it grew from shoulder to shoulder in front of his neck and it was just a half circle right there. Um, so I googled it because that's how we, <laughs> we learn what's wrong. I'm sure the doctors love that. So we googled it and it looked textbook Lyme disease. My husband took him into Lunenburg and the, it wasn't a doctor we normally saw and he just kind of brushed it off and told him it was just a heat rash and just go home and rest. And I, in my gut, felt like there was more to it than just a heat rash. A few weeks went by and I was still feeling really uneasy and Jesse was not as energetic as he normally would have been. So we checked again and they said, there's nothing, just rest. Um, and I was getting frustrated. So one afternoon, summer vacation, he's sitting out there watching his dad. Jesse was just sitting on the grass. His dad had pulled the truck in and had these wood pieces and he was just shoving them out of the back of the truck and throwing them out of the truck which Jesse loved doing when he was eight and nine and he was just sitting there watching his dad do it and I said Jesse don't want, don't you want to go help he said yeah but my legs are too tired and it was so sad and it was not characteristic of him and that was just like the final thing for me. Something was seriously wrong. So we took him in to the Bridgewater Emerge. When they finally got us in and talked to us about it, they said they had called Infectious Disease Department at the IWK and they wanted him in there first thing the next morning. So first thing in the morning we made arrangements. We had other children and we got Jesse up there and they said absolutely it's Lyme disease. They asked us just a few questions and they knew right away what it was. Jesse faced a two-week stay in hospital, but everything changed overnight. They said uh, they didn't know how it happened or what exactly happened, but the fluids they had given him and the medication they had given him, he was okay and he could go home that day. It was, it was a miracle, it really was, because he shouldn't have been able to be released. They took such good care of him though, the IWK was amazing. They, he was so happy to be there, even with needles in him and tubes coming out. So um, they sent him home with antibiotics, which tasted horrible, and he took those twice a day for about a month. And he's been good ever since. The family had always done tick checks. I mean, at that time we were doing tick checks, and we never even saw that tick. And so we, we do tick checks every night. We did get a whole bunch of chickens, and that really did cut down on the ticks. Um, we don't currently have chickens. <laughs> Something else ate the chickens, so we don't have chickens at the moment, but that made a difference. And I, I pretty much shook for two and a half months. Um, when we first met Joel, she was struggling. Um, I have symptoms this year, similar, except now it's affecting my head and um, I'm feeling nauseated and more flu-like symptoms as well as, as the shaking. Happily, she is now recovering. Well, in July of 2018, I had the flu. And I had the flu for a week and it wouldn't go away, so I went to the doctor and he said, well, I think you have Lyme disease and I'm going to send you for a test. 
and I asked him if he would put me on antibiotics and he said no we have a protocol and I'm following protocol and you don't have a tick you don't have a rash and you don't have a bullseye so I will send you for a test and we'll wait till the test comes back. The following week I started to shake and after shaking for a few days um, I decided to go back to the doctor and he said I don't have the test back so I won't give you antibiotics and you'll just have to wait. So I waited for a few more days and, the, and the, the symptoms got worse and worse so I went to emergency and going to emergency I saw a doctor there and she said well you have all the symptoms of Lyme disease if you'd like I'll give you antibiotics and I said yes I'd like antibiotics and she said also when your test comes back it most likely will come back negative because they've taken it too soon. So I was put on antibiotics and I was on them for about two weeks and then my doctor called and he said we have your tests back and they're negative so stop taking the antibiotics. So being a good patient I did and my symptoms got worse to the point I could not walk properly, I shook constantly and so they started sending me to doctors. I was sent to a neurologist, I was sent for a CT scan, I was ultimately taking tons and tons of blood tests everything came back that I was very healthy, which I was, except I had Lyme disease. It affects your whole life. I couldn't live my life. I'm a very active person. I couldn't do anything except rest. I would do things in the morning for about an hour and then I was exhausted. So it's extremely frustrating from that point of view, especially if you're an active person. And it's extremely frustrating because it's so hard to convince them Maybe my tests are good, but I'm ill and I, I need some antibiotics. So mostly it's just constant frustration. May 2018. I noticed I had a lump on my leg and I hadn't really thought too much about it and uh, didn't itch or anything, but it was you know about the size of a quarter and got down there and uh, I had a tick on it. And I guess it had been there for a few days and hadn't even noticed it. So I, um, I pulled it out and didn't really think any more about it. And then that was Thursday. On uh, Sunday, I drove from Lunenburg to Moncton, which is about a three and a half hour drive. By the time I got to Moncton, I could hardly move. Uh, my neck was stiff and seized up and all my joints were seized up. And I got out of the car and managed to get into the hotel and took some Tylenol and went to bed. Next day, I got up and drove all the way from Moncton to Ottawa and alternated between the heater and the air conditioner and the window open. Got home on the Monday, uh, went to see my doctor on Tuesday and started on a course of antibiotics. The Ontario protocol for diagnosing Lyme disease was quite different than Nova Scotia's in 2018. So the doctor in Ottawa began treatment immediately. So about two weeks after I'd uh, finished the antibiotics, so it's about a month between now, the bite time and, and then, and uh, I uh, noticed that my heart rate was getting very slow, um, which is kind of weird. So I went in to see my family doctor and she sends me over to the emergency right away. Uh, fortunately, the emergency is attached to the Heart Institute in Ottawa and they take my, vitals and all that and checked my heart rate and said, well, you're not going home. But it turns out that um, this is perhaps a complication of Lyme disease called Lyme carditis where the bacteria gets into the heart and basically just screws up the electrical system. So they have to put in a pacemaker to keep it beating properly. Um, I've since learned that you know, perhaps they could have put me on another course of antibiotics, uh, intravenous antibiotics and treated it that way. But most doctors and you know, the Heart Institute, they, they, they knew what was wrong with me. They knew I had a slow heart rate. They knew how to treat that. It's called bradycardia. Um, so their treatment is they give you pacemaker, end of story, they know how to treat it. And doing more reading on it afterwards, it uh, seems to be more and more common, but so many doctors don't recognize Lyme disease and even recognizing or knowing about Lyme carditis, that a lot of it goes undiagnosed. Medical specialists work within their own established procedures without considering the scope and range of Lyme disease symptoms. So I now have a pacemaker and uh, I'll have it for the rest of my life.
Three years ago, William was a normal, healthy four-year-old. So one day we woke up and William had a high fever and he developed a rash from the neck to his toes. We decided we'd take him into outpatient because it was not like William. William's a very active child. And the doctor looked him over and said that they thought it was uh, just a viral rash and to just let it run its course because there was no nothing they can do for it. Took him home and a few days later the rash and the fevers continued. William started to become very drowsy, very tired all the time not wanting to play like any average four-year-old. William had many joint pains. I can remember getting up in the morning with him and he would be screaming because his legs were, his knees were swollen and his legs, he couldn't move his legs. After visiting outpatients multiple times and going to the IWK, it took one visit to our nurse practitioner and we walked in her office and she said, wow, she couldn't believe it. William was a poster child for Lyme disease. She said, William, exhibit many symptoms, the high fever and the rash. The rash did not necessarily look like bullseye rashes, but he had many different types of rashes and colors all over his body. Our nurse practitioner sent us up for blood work and it came back with flags saying that this child had Lyme disease. They had the Lyme disease in between my legs and it hurt on, on the bottom of my knees. You mean behind? As soon as William got the amoxicillin, the doctors prescribed the amoxicillin, within days the rash was gone. He was feeling 100% better. He was out riding his bike. It was like amazing to see this child who a couple days ago wasn't eating, was, was sleeping all the time, high fever, and then a few days later he was a different child. What do you do to make sure you don't get it again? Stay in bed. Really? <laughs> like a lazy teenager? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Take your body for tits. Take my body for tits. Clyde found a tick on his neck in 2016. Truth is, at the time, I really didn't think anything of it because I never heard much about Lyme disease anyway. So then, but then in January 2017, I started getting tired. I was starting to get pains in my stomach, sort of like flu-like symptoms, pains in my chest, headache, stiff neck. And then I had hot and cold sweats, and then my joints swelled up that I had a hard time getting out to be to go to work. By the time April came, I was pretty played out and I started to lose some weight. And I went down to my doctor in Chester. She sent me for some tests and she said I come back negative. Well, she said, you don't have Lyme disease. So anyway, she, then, she did all these different tests and then a whole year goes by and it's in spring of 2018. She weighed me and I only weighed 130 pounds and I was down 25 pounds. And I went to leave her off and she said, you know what your trouble is? It's all in your mind. And so then in the later part of September 2018, I went into Scotia Med at by Sobeys under Bedford Highway. And I went in and I got, talked to this Indian doctor and she, I told her what happened to me. She gave me two pills a day for three weeks. And when the three weeks was up, I was starting to feel a little better. And I, so then I went back in the second time and there was another different doctor on, but he gave me three weeks more. And I started feeling better and I started gaining a little bit of weight. So then I went back in the third time and when I got in there on, on that Saturday, he had a bad attitude, but he gave me three more weeks and said, this is it, you're not getting any more. His requests for continued antibiotics were met with resistance. Three months went by and then I started feeling going downhill again, so I called in and they said, doctor, the doctor was on call this Saturday, would you like to see? I went in, she gave me six weeks of medication, I started to feel better, and when I went back in, she said, Sorry, but I can't give you any more medication. So since then, I've had none. So right now, I, I'm just, I'm not, like a nothing. If you, I'd just be happy if I could walk up and down steps normal, and that would make me feel good, because I know that my chances of being as good as I was before this happens, not, it's not gonna happen. But, uh, but right now, I've gotten down steps, it's not very easy. And the joints are so sore that, but anyway, Holly McKay was a very active, healthy young woman when almost 10 years ago, something went terribly wrong. It started, I suppose, with like seizing up of the muscles and the joints and excruciating pain. I was bedridden for a while. Holly's doctor couldn't figure out what was causing her pain and symptoms. Bless her heart, she was trying. She didn't know. She just was following the book. 
Holly's visits to emergency didn't lead to a diagnosis. The doctor came to see me. He wouldn't even take my blood pressure or anything. He didn't even check my vitals. He said, look, he said, you don't need a doctor. You need to get your head checked. I was rushed to emergency at least, at least five times. And every single time I was sent away. Frustrated, she turned to a naturopath. I would say I was probably sick for 10 years before I found out uh, when I came to Dr. Raid and he, I walked in the office and I told him a few symptoms and he immediately was like, it's Lyme. And uh, we, sent the, we sent the samples to um, Boulder, Colorado, somewhere. And yeah, they came back positive. And when I told my doctor um, that I had, that it was Lyme, she looked very skeptical. Once she received treatment for Lyme, her health finally started to improve. There are no words to describe a lot of the symptoms. There are no words. I tried, you know, like, and when you try to describe something and there are no words, it can make you look like you're crazy. <laughs> so, you know, it's understandable why people think it's odd, why people don't believe you, you know. In April 2019, Nova Scotia released new guidance for primary care, emergency medicine providers, and healthcare professionals. Prophylactically, we do treat for Lyme if the tick has been on for more than 24 hours that the patient is aware of, but you have 72 hours to treat. Earlier on in uh, an infection, and particularly with Lyme, or actually any of the co-infections, antibiotics has a much higher rate of success. So I would encourage people, especially if it's right at the beginning, to definitely get antibiotics. Early Lyme is when you were diagnosed within the four weeks. Late Lyme is often sometimes when people do not know they have Lyme disease and we do testing later on and they have long-term symptoms. So the duration with nerve involvement, um, Bell's palsy, uh, these kind of issues that we treat for a longer duration, up to 28 days. Ticks are plentiful in Lunenburg County, found in tall grass and on the edge of forests. Because there is controversy about Lyme detection and treatment, doctors, and even the chief medical officer, citing the nature of this project, declined an interview. But a doctor from the United States, who summers in Lunenburg, was willing to speak to this concern. Systemic manifestations really are nonspecific in many ways. Number one, you know, fever, malaise, just feeling unwell, headache, the kind of things that you can see with many different diseases. And then the neurologic diseases, there's a whole host of typical neurologic diseases. Things like Bell's palsy, facial nerve palsy is a very common uh, neurologic disease. Meningitis, you can actually get a Lyme meningitis. You can get a Lyme encephalitis. It's not like other illnesses. It's very, yeah, it's up and down. Doctors can misdiagnose a Lyme patient as having dementia when they are really experiencing Lyme's neurological symptoms. There are cardiac symptoms. There's a, a cardiac heart block where the electrical system of the heart is blocked. Some of the typical Lyme disease symptoms are the wandering joint pain. So one day it'll be in their ankle and one day it'll be in their knee. And typically the response of how people describe something like that are, I feel like I'm crazy because this, all of this is going on and it doesn't seem to make sense. My knee was swollen and really painful and then I just woke up one morning and it was gone and then it would reoccur somewhere else. Sometimes there are remitting fevers that come and go. Um, often a lot of other body pains, different things like burning, the bottom of burning feet. Um, sometimes people will feel like they have a vibration in their body and they'll say that's just the only way that I can really describe it. I had a girl that called me and she was describing the symptom to me and she said there's this one that's really difficult for me. She was she was bedridden at the time and she said it feels like, uh, you know, when the television goes fuzzy, the television goes black and white. <laughs> she said that's what it feels like my the inside of my body. And I was like, you nailed it. You nailed it. That's exactly it. And like to some people that would be like, OK, well, it's not like it's painful. Oh, man, let me tell you, it is not a nice feeling. You're lying in bed trying to sleep. And it's like you've been plugged into an electric socket. 
Although we always hear about the cases that don't always do so well, the truth is the great majority of them do. But the doctors have to see the disease. As far as knowing how to treat it, it's quite simple. I mean, I've been in contact with Lyme disease. I was in Connecticut. I was, I was uh, associated with the doctors who discovered Lyme disease. And so I've been involved with it from the beginning. I go out and I do not worry about Lyme disease, of course. Engorged females lay a single egg mass, up to 1,500 to 2,000 eggs, in mid to late May, and then die. The tick life cycle begins with eggs that become larvae, which grow into nymphs and then adults, which feed on large mammals. Several adult males will mate with one female, producing thousands of eggs once again. Unfed female black-legged ticks are easily distinguished from other ticks by the orange-red body surrounding the black scutum. In terms of a diagnosis of Lyme disease, there's lots of different criteria that are put out by Health Canada. So the typical understanding of diagnosis for Lyme disease is to do the Western blot and the ELISA tests. Here at the clinic, we have a, a few other tests that we can do. None of them are officially approved. They just provide a little bit more insight as to how the body is actually reacting to Lyme disease. So one of the tests is an LE spot test. It's a T cell test that looks at a different component of the immune system than the antibody tests which are traditionally used. Ambiguity of Lyme tests is a common thread. It doesn't work if taken too soon or if you've tested positive before. Veterinarians use the C6 test for Lyme antibodies and Quant C6 test along with the urinalysis to determine if antibodies are needed. And so our initial screening test is called the SNAP40X. It's a, about a 15 minute test. We can do it in the clinic. I think the number one, you know, thing is to have their their pets on a preventative uh, product as well as vaccinating. Occasionally cats, but not not often, uh, and quite frequently horses in this area. Dan was the first documented case of Lyme disease in Nova Scotia. We had come home one day, and he was standing in the stall, and he was really when he looked at him, he looked like a wooden horse. His all four legs were swelling up right from top to bottom, full size, like probably eight, nine inches across. Uh, we had no idea what it was. We brought the vet from Nova Clinic down, and by the time we actually knew it was Lyme disease, he was already being treated. So within two days, he was back to normal. From then on, we have never had a reoccurrence, which is good. Like humans, some animals have died from Lyme disease. Probably less than 5% of the dogs that are exposed to the bacteria actually ever show clinical signs. Other times we see fever, lethargy, decreased appetite. The most common one is lameness, and it's a shifting lameness. It'll go from leg to leg. It's not staying in the same leg all the time. Being more, we're seeing more uh, cases of uh, positive Lyme disease, and we're seeing more ticks. Before pet vaccination, Gracie's owner used an amber necklace to ward off ticks. In Martins River, we lived on a converted farm. And she'd run, I let her run loose and she'd come back with all kinds on her. Well, I'll just say on average, maybe half a dozen at a crack. <laughs> After the necklace, they pretty well disappeared, I'm told, and well, it wasn't an issue anymore. Prevention takes many forms, from diligent self checking and permethrin treated clothing to free ranging assists from the animal kingdom. We have had guinea hens here for about three years now. Since we've had the guineas, we haven't really seen that many ticks. Um, the first year we had guineas, it was not uncommon for us to pick up to 20 ticks a day off of each of us, uh, especially after walking back through the, the hay fields and the back pastures. Uh, we have quite a bit of water frontage down along Martins Cove over towards First Peninsula, and the ticks down there were um, thick, very thick. Um, the guinea hens range a little farther than the chickens do uh, and we have uh, several hundred acres here. We wanted something that was going to range a little further 
they've made a huge difference both in ourselves and our livestock. Uh, we, we have some uh, goats that we milk here, some dairy goats, and we were quite often finding ticks on them after they were out free ranging in the pastures. With the addition of the guinea hens, it's very seldom that we find ticks on them now. They move in a flock very similar to, as you would see, plovers on the beach. Um, they're really interesting. They're very noisy. They're very annoying. We're very fortunate. Our neighbors' only complaint is that our guineas don't spend enough time over in their yard. They enjoy the fact that the guineas will come over there, help them with their ticks, and then leave. They are great watchdogs. Um, we enjoy them very much. Nobody gets into our yard without us knowing. When we do find a nest before they hatch, we will bring them into the house and put them in an incubator and hatch them in the house uh, and we do have we do have a waiting list for people looking for Keats specifically for tick control. He didn't quite figure out what was going on and then finally thought of Lyme and went to his doctor. So he did some more research on things we can do. We were both very worried about getting Lyme disease and we found a place in the United States called Insect Shield that has clothing impregnated with permethium, a chemical that kills the tick, and we decided to get some. I wear the protective clothing, but I also do other things. I do the tick check if I've been out in the garden, and usually I take a shower after, after coming in from working out in the garden. We have a lot of deer on our property. Uh, we have an electric fence around our vegetable garden and we have something called a scarecrow out here by our perennial garden. What it does, it, it triggers a water spray that if a deer gets near, they get sprayed and it, uh, it's a motion sensor. We've been trying different strategies to cut down the tick population in the area. For me, it's been worth it to have, have the clothing. Friday night I went to bed I was so tired that I just sort of sat down fell down and went to sleep and I didn't do my normal just kind of once over and it was in the afternoon when I was getting ready to jump in the shower that I went hmm thinking it was dirt and all of a sudden oh, tro <laughs> go trooping downstairs with a towel on you know to my husband and say is this a tick and so out comes the tick removal kit and we dig it out and he was in there quite well and sure enough it was little deer tick buried deep, deep, deep in my bicep. First time in 10 years. Um, I've been very fortunate, but Monday morning, nine o'clock, I'm calling my doctor saying, you know, send me the script. Um, reception does their usual sort of, are you sure? And I'm like, I'm a landscaper, I know my tick. She went, oh, okay, I'll put you right through. My mom has been subject to uh, Lyme three times. She has some long-term effects from it. My father as well, my brother-in-law, my truck driver, my head gardener. Most people recover from it, um, but not everyone. And there's a lot of chronic long-term effects. Um, I've unfortunately heard of several people who've lost their lives to chronic Lyme. And so um, the seriousness can't be understated. And you don't need to live in the country. I mean, my house currently is right in the middle of town and I had to fence my veggie garden because I found out deer can eat 250 tomatoes in a night. So. Dr. Rob Murray, seen here sweeping ticks, contracted Lyme disease in 2013. I didn't recognize the rash. I was kayaking, it was a weekend, and a huge rash in the inside of my leg, thigh. But a year later, I went to the doctor because the complaints were a feeling that my body was aging. I felt like I was walking around in the body of a 100-year-old. And one thing that's always been in the back of my mind is this Lyme disease. Unable to get diagnosed in Nova Scotia, Dr. Murray heard of successful treatment in the United States. At that point, I got tested in the States. The full treatment took a year and a half. That's the kind of area that I'm looking for. After his recovery, Dr. Murray became what many call a Lyme warrior, using his expertise as a dentist and considerable medical knowledge to educate and advocate for victims of this disease. 
Obviously, prevention is far better than treatment any day. So let's not get bitten. They pick up the infections from rodents. The deer just act as transport, as taxi around the neighborhoods here. Get rid of your leaf litter. Clean away sticks and branches. Keep the grass clippings, you know, get rid of them, that sort of stuff. Ticks are always on the ecotone, on the edge of a forest and a field, um, in this boundary kind of layer. We want people to enjoy the outdoors, but to do it safely. Watch where you walk, know your enemy, know where the ticks are going to be. Know that they're likely to be in that long grass at the edge of your property. It doesn't have to be in the woods. It's going to be on the side of the trail, in the bushes and the grass on the side of the trail. So you have to watch your pets, that so they don't bring them into the house. Dressing properly at all times, ticks have to climb up. They don't, you have to know their habits. They don't uh, fly or jump. So we know already that if you can spray your footwear and clothing with permethrin, which you can buy here as ant spray, if you can get some of that on the clothing, it's gonna stick as on the clothing and the footwear for about six weeks or six washes. That acts as a repellent and an insecticide. If they, if they jump off you before they can crawl up, so much the better. Check my body for ticks. Tick checks are the main thing. At the end of the day, if you've been in tick country, showering and doing complete tech, tick check or having your partner do it, or having a full length mirror, because you're gonna find them in weird places like in your ear, in your belly button, armpit, uh, any place that's warm, uh, sweaty. Definitely do tick checks after every hike that you've done, as well as checking the morning after. People often forget that it can, they can be in their hair, they can be on their bags, they can be in their car. So really, anytime you shower, I would do a tick check. Just run your hands all over every part of your body, including your bum crack and behind your ears, everywhere along your hair. Uh, brush your hair before going to bed, especially if you have longer hair. They can hide and they can figure out ways to kind of get around there. But you've got time. It takes some time for that tick to crawl around to find the place where, that it wants to latch on to. It takes some time to glue their mouth parts to the body. It takes some time to dissolve that skin and before they take on a blood meal. And they, they start feeding first and then once they're uh, filled up enough, the bacteria are ejected through their salivary glands back into the person. So this takes a number of hours. So the sooner you can get that, if you can keep the tick off, that's the best. The sooner you get that tick off, if you find it, that's even better. Teachers at Blue Nose Academy are proactive when a child comes in from recess with a tick. In teaching, if we do come across a tick that can't easily be removed just from the, the tape, we do make a call to parents to come in and uh, they usually take them to outpatients. And I'm not afraid of ticks. And what does your mom do to help you make sure you haven't got any ticks on you? Tick check. Armed with the knowledge of the dangers of ticks and how to check for them, Isaac and Carly, free-range youngsters as their Nana calls them, have no fear of playing outdoors. Mommy or Daddy tells us to, 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 to like put our arms up. Okay. Like our legs down, put our legs up, or like take our... Our socks off, lift up her chin. They could hide. Where could they hide? Um, in your toes, your hands, back here, your hair, somewhere. We don't want to, for our family, to not be going outside and be exactly. afraid to be outside. We want to still be doing the activities that we would normally do, but we just every night do a tick check and um, check and see if there are ticks and if they are remove them and uh, note the site keep the tick if it's a if it's a small one and watch for other signs so it's something to be aware of but not afraid of i'd say mj here with a tick removal tip for you pretend that this is a tick embedded in your body and by the way if a tick is ballooned to this size on your body you have a bit of a problem what you want to do is use a tick removal tool available from canlime.org or better drug stores. Take the tick removal tool, slide it between the tick and your skin, pinching it off to keep the jaws from excreting more toxin into your body, and then pull straight up. That way, the tick will be removed whole, and all your tick problems, at least for the time being, will simply drift away. 
but whatever you do, don't um, squeeze that tick. Try to get underneath it. If it's on your clothing, you can use a lint roller, you can use some tape, you can use duct tape uh, if you want to get them off the fur of, um, of a pet. The biggest mistake people are going to make is think, well, I will know if I have one of those on me. I'll be able to sense it. You can't. They're sneaky. You cannot feel them. They produce a local anesthetic. They can um, take on one of these blood meals and hang on to you for five days, seven days before they fall off and you won't even know that they were there. The trick is to keep everything tucked in all the way up. I said spray footwear, keep pants tucked in, uh, socks pulled up over pants, shirts tucked into the back. Keep on checking them, I found, because they will pull out during the day. So if you're hiking and walking, um, if you're going to sit down somewhere, think about it. Sit down in the sun where the grass is short, somewhere where ticks aren't going to uh, want to be. I've had people comment that they've had a tick on them without even going outside. If you have animals that go outside, it might bring them back in. I've also used different types of essential oils for helping to prevent the ticks or other bugs from um, biting in the first place. Um, Atlantic is a great product that I've used before, as well as getting other good quality uh, lemongrass oils. Geranium is really helpful as well. You can kind of make a different concoction. There are certain plants uh, like barberry um, that we advocate you either keep them away from your house or don't plant them at all uh, because we know that that's one of the ones that ticks are drawn to. Um, frequently, for a couple of reasons now, uh, we often recommend putting a, a stone, crushed stone border around the perimeter of the house. So you go from hardscape to hardscape, and it's less hospitable for ticks to travel. Ideally, we would all cut our lawns like a golf course because it makes it hot and dry. Planting certain plant species that ticks um, don't care for much, like perennial geranium or juniper. There's a, a number of, of plants that they don't particularly love or will help to ward them off. The gardeners will often, they do the, the very sexy socks over pants. Uh, so that they can see things coming up and down their legs. I use a product called No Bite Me by Sally Anders because I've found, for me, that's the best one without basically coating myself in DEET. Use the repellents certainly. Now it's not permitted for them to sell clothing that says um, good for ticks in Canada, but if it says bug-free clothing, then it goes through the same process. I do use a combination. I can't buy pre-treated boots and certain pieces of clothing on here that are pre-treated, so I have to use the spray. The more we, you know, make people aware, the better. And if you can support uh, you know, private groups like Canadian Lyme Disease Foundation, so much the better. Not every tick has Lyme disease in it, and it's not necessarily uh, helpful to have this heightened fear of you know, avoiding the outdoors. If you develop any flu-like symptoms um, after, you know, after being bitten by a tick, such as fever, um, joint pain, headaches, the big one is any type of rash that's greater than five centimeters that could be in any part of your body, that is a huge red flag for Lyme disease. The bullseye also, but the rash, people didn't really understand what that was before because it would just appear like a hive leg rash. That is critical. Often if there's a susceptible tissue, someone's injured their knee a dozen times or their back, those are the areas that they'll experience more pain or more trouble rather than someone else might actually have more nerve damage due to something else in the past. So it's one of the things that makes Lyme disease and different co-infections harder to actually even diagnose. <laughs> if treated quickly, most patients recover, and the situation in Lunenburg is improving. Extreme cases do persist, and those who have suffered the most have a message for doctors and others who share these journeys. They need to listen. <laughs> they need to actually listen. And many doctors are listening. In August 2019, 
Theo's experience is quite different from the stories you've just heard. I had thought I had pulled a muscle in my leg. There was a bit of swelling one day when I woke up. Um, I had never seen a tick or a tick bite. And over the next couple days, it progressively got more sore, more inflamed. And that morning I woke up uh, drenched in sweat. So I went to the doctor later that day and the doctor asked me some questions. He said, I have Lyme based on that rash, based on the symptoms that I had talked about. He said I might need two weeks, uh, but he gave me three just in case to sort of uh, see how things went. The antibiotics worked very quickly and so I kept feeling every day I felt better, you know, and even sort of within the day I was feeling better. And yeah, now I feel pretty good. I mean, there's still sensitivity in this sort of that specific area. Um, you know, I'm trying to not push myself too hard. I haven't had a lot of side effects from the antibiotics, which people often talk about. Um, so psychologically, I feel sort of like I've overcome it. Now I'm not tricking myself and I, you know, I'm still being conscious. I'm still have at least a week, if not more of antibiotics to take. We're also at a slight advantage that our medical system is taxed by the amount of cases, but that's a, that is a benefit in other places where Lyme is not as well known, it's not as well diagnosed, and, I'm, and I think it's important to recognize that our, that our uh, health practitioners here are becoming quite good at diagnosing it because it's such an epidemic. Uh, so that's a bit of a gift and a curse. Yeah. The biggest thing to stress is that people make themselves aware. Don't panic. If you don't feel well, go see your doctor. I was very fortunate. I called my nurse practitioner. I explained. There was no doubt. They said immediately, you know, they sent the script right to the pharmacy. It was available in 15 minutes for me. We got a new Dr. Hackshaw in Chester now, and he seemed to be a pretty reasonable person to talk to. When I went in 2019, there was a complete difference in attitude. So it's getting better, but it still has a long way to go. It seems like there's a lot more awareness in this county, certainly of Lyme disease. It, the general public's much more aware of the early symptoms, um, what to look for, um, and it sounds like the prescription, the doxycycline, is being um, given very precautionarily, um, which I think is good, but I fear that in other parts of the province that's not happening to nearly the same degree, and so, you know, what worries me is someone coming and spending a weekend on the South Shore and then going back to wherever they live and uh, you know their medical support team there just not having the same level of awareness of some, something that could have happened to them while they were here. We present ourselves as a tourist town, tourist area. And if I were a tourist in this area and I went home with Lyme disease, especially to an area where it's not well known, I would not be promoting this as a place to go. <laughs> Visitors follow advice about potential illnesses in their travel destinations and get the necessary shots. Likewise, tourists to tick populated areas should be educated about prevention and symptoms of Lyme disease and know that Lyme can be easily treated if caught early. It could be in the tour book even. Uh, Newfoundland's tour book warns you of driving after dark because of moose. Uh, so we should be able to warn people about tick areas, especially the ones that have known high populations. I don't think telling people oh, there's no problem is the way to go. That's just lying to people. It doesn't help with trying to get my family to move here to be closer, though. Is there a message for those suffering now? Don't give up. <laughs> yeah, don't give up. There, there is light at the end of the tunnel, for sure. For sure, there's absolutely. And be your own advocate.